We're in week two of our series, Thrive, and this is basically supposed to be a four to five week study in the book of Philippians, but last week we only got through half of verse one, <laughs> so it may not be four, I don't know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, it was a tough message, it's a tough message last week, but at the same time, I think it was one of the most important messages that I've preached since I've been here, and so if you missed it, please go back. You can use the new app if you want to or go online and listen to that message through videocast or podcast. Um, I'm not going to try to review it. It'd just be too hard to go back through that. Um, We'll touch on it as we read verse 1 again, but I want to jump right into the Word. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your presence, for your spirit. I pray that your Word, I know your Word, won't come back void, and so we thank you for that. Lord, we pray you'd bless it. I I pray that you would open our our ears and our hearts to receive your word. Pray that you would anoint my lips and speak through through me the message that you would have me to preach in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Philippians 1, starting with verse 1 again. We'll just read it again because we didn't get through it. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. And if you weren't here, that's the word we, we talked about the entire time. What does that mean? to the Christian life and to the Christian walk. So be sure to go back and listen to that. I'm writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong. That's another word of ownership to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. Verse 2, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. This verse is basically a prayer. Paul's basically writing out a prayer for this special group of people, this church. But what jumped out to me as I studied wasn't exactly what he said or what he prayed. It was what he didn't say, what he didn't pray. He didn't pray that they would have more stuff. He didn't pray that they would have more money or more things. And that's really my first point. If you look at the screen, New Testament Christianity is at war with the cultural demands around us. Can we have the next slide? New Testament Christianity is at war with the cultural demands. We are bombarded from this culture. Every time we watch television, every time we go online, every time we go on social media, we are bombarded with what the world would dictate to us is important for us to have to be somebody. I watched two football games yesterday, neither of which went the way that I wanted them to go. Can I get an amen? Or the one Monday night either. Just don't talk about it. Thank you. If somebody says roll tide, I will come off this stage. (laughs) I was what? (laughs) I got your roll tide. All right. Anyway, I was watching these these games and I was going to try to count how many commercials just we're, we're overtly just trying to cram things and stuff down, and I couldn't, every one of them. We're being bombarded and see the danger, and when I, and when I say at war, it's at war with the, with the values that we're taught. And so the danger is we fall into this trap of being consumed with consumerism. And consumed with material things and and thinking about those things. And guess what happens? Here's the danger. They begin to bleed over into our prayer life. We begin focusing on those things even when we're supposed to be praying about other things. We end up praying for the wrong things. And here's what happens. Here's the danger of of what praying for the wrong thing and focusing on the wrong thing can happen. We don't get what we're praying for, and then we get mad at God. And it affects our faith, it affects our relationship with Christ, but we're not praying the will of the Father, and so we don't get what we're praying for, and we're like, why does God not like me? Why is God not going to answer? Why is he not answering my prayers? It affects our walk with Christ. We're praying for the wrong thing. Uh, My grandmother... Uh, we called her Gramsie. This is years ago. She's been, she's been gone for quite some time. But she used to have a friend who was even older than her. They were both widowed. She lived across the street. Her name was Bertha. And she lived across the street. 
And so Gramsci would go over and check on her from time to time. And so she went over one day to check on Bertha and knocked on the door, and nobody came back to the door, but she heard some crying. She heard somebody crying on the inside, so she got worried, and she, she, she was very short. She was like this, like four foot seven, or I don't know, very small, very short, and she, would like, she peeked up into the little window and saw Bertha on the couch with her head in her hands just crying. And so she tried the door, and the door was open, and she went in, and she's like, Bertha, what's wrong? And Bertha just couldn't even get her breath. She's just crying. Oh, God, oh, God. And then she said, he's dead. He's dead. And, and Graham's like, Bertha, I'm so sorry. Who, who's, who, who died? What happened? And Bertha started pointing at the television. He's dead. Luke is dead. And I just can't believe it. I just can't believe it. And Gramsci realized she was talking about a soap opera character. And listen, my grandmother, if she didn't make it to heaven, none of us have a chance. But in that moment, she told me she cussed and turned around, not without another word, and went right back to her house. She was furious. She could not believe. The story is not over. So in church that Sunday morning, it was an older church, a little church, and they used to take, still take prayer requests from whoever in the services. Are you, anybody following me where I'm going? She, this is the God's honest truth, she requested prayer for his family. <laughs> now talk about praying for the wrong things, Okay. Sorry, I know that, that, that was a stretch to use that story, but I had to. It was just too good, too good. But we can, we can end up falling into the trap of praying for the wrong things, being consumed by the wrong things. And hey, look, look, having nice things is fine. It's fine, but that's not God's primary concern for you. Having more stuff and nicer stuff is not his main concern for you. Following Jesus is. Right. Connecting to that God-given purpose in being used in his kingdom is having the joy of the Lord and being sustained by that strength is. Amen. Your kid's soul is. Amen. Now, here's the way I see it. Now, this is not, you know, I don't have a scripture for you, so listen, keep your emails to yourself. This is just my opinion, all right? It may be oversimplified, but if you want to buy something new, say it's a new car, Look at your budget. Make a budget. Amen. See if there's, a, there's margin there. If there's not, save your money. Don't go into some major debt for it. But if you've got it and you want it, then buy it. Come on, don't over-spiritualize it. But listen, it can't consume our prayer life. Amen. Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. When I took my first full-time ministerial position, I was in my mid-20s, early to mid-20s, and it was time to change cars. I'll be honest. I had driven that car, for this particular car, forever, and it was, it was going down fast. So it was time to buy, and I was excited. I had a full-time job, all this stuff, and I found a 93 Mazda 929. Anybody? Nice, right? And, of course, it was used. This was 96 or 7 at this point, but it was nice. Somebody had taken care of it. It had leather seats. It had heated seats. I had never had that, never since had, <laughs> had heated seats. But, man, this car was awesome. I wanted this car, so I got this car. And then this car got me because I have never done this since then, but I took that car down and had it professionally cleaned every Saturday, had it vacuumed. This, I mean, this car, it was rear-wheel drive, just smooth. And I just loved this car, and I think I loved this car a little too much because I've totaled this car after four months. <laughs> Listen, I didn't have a scratch on me. Totaled the car, not a scratch on me. You can't convince me otherwise. I think God took that car from me. I'm totally being serious. I think he took us. It was not a healthy thing in my life. We cannot allow things to consume us Amen. and to especially to bleed over into our prayer life. So Paul doesn't use this moment, back to our scripture, to pray about things. And you know what else he doesn't pray for them? Safety. Pastor Allen, two weeks in a row, you're going to get us? Now, listen, this word's full of more. <laughs> he did not pray for their safety. That's another thing in our culture that consumes us. 
we're constantly worried and have fear and let anxiety take over. Lord, help us to be safe. Help my, my job to not lose my job. I want it to be safe. I want my finances to be safe. My kids to be, I want my house to be safe, safe, safe. For the most part, New Testament believers never prayed for safety. They just seem to accept the fact that if they followed Jesus, it would be dangerous. It was illegal. Paul wrote this letter from prison because of the gospel. They just saw it as something they had. It came with the territory, risking their lives for the gospel. So they didn't spend much time praying for safety. But you know what they prayed for? Boldness. They prayed for boldness and they prayed for grace and peace so that no matter what they faced, no matter what trial they went to, no matter what happened to them, they would have the boldness and the grace and the mercy and the peace to share the love of Jesus no matter what. That's what they prayed for. I can only find one place in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 2 where Paul thanked a group of believers for praying for his safety during an unusually dangerous trip that he was on. Everybody look at me, though. Look at me. I don't want you to take me the wrong way. I don't, I'm not saying at all that it's wrong. That we should never pray for safety. I pray safety and a hedge of protection and angels to be dispatched around my girls every single day. Anybody with me? Come on. That's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. But here's the point I want to make in battling that culture that we're talking about. Safety should never be our focus. It should never be our focus, just like the materialism and the consumerism should not be our focus and take up all of our prayer life and our prayer time. Pastor, is God not concerned with my safety? Of course he is. He's a loving father. But he's more concerned with your soul. He sees the eternal. Safety is a temporary thing. You hear me? But our souls are eternal. And so they are therefore more important. Your kids' souls are more important even than their safety. That's why Paul could say things like he did in Philipp in later on in Philippians. To live is Christ and to die is gain. My interpretation of that is he's saying, I'm ten foot tall and bulletproof. Come on, if I'm alive, then I'm doing something for the kingdom. If I'm alive, I'm doing something for Jesus. If you kill me, well, I'm with Jesus. So I win either way. Wow. What a way and attitude to live our lives. How freeing is that? Now, I'm not there yet. You're not there yet, but we're on a journey. But what if we actually lived our lives with that attitude to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that's freedom. That is freedom. freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, listen, safety is important, but it's not the heartbeat of the gospel. Grace is. Love is. Hope is. Peace is. And so those are the things, kingdom things, should be taking up our prayer life and dictate our Christianity. Amen. Amen. Verse 3. We're going to be in this thing forever. Here we go. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Every time I think of you, I give thanks. Do you have anybody in your life that is just a blessing to you? I mean, they are just, you just, you just thought of them right then. When was the last time you thanked God for that person? When was the last time you thanked that person? When was the last time you sent them a text? It's so easy these days. When was the last time you sent him an email or gave him a shout-out on social media? Or, God forbid, you picked up a pen and a piece of paper and actually wrote something physically and sent them a letter. Now, come on. I'm preaching this, but this is not, easy. This is not my area. This is not my strong point. This is not my, my gifting. No comments from this area right here. Listen, I know exhortation and encouragement. It's not, not my necessarily my wheelhouse, but listen. There's so many benefits. It is so powerful. Living a life of gratitude and thanksgiving and encouragement. Listen, I have made it, I've, I've just decided I'm going to be intentional about getting better at doing this. Anybody else? Come on. This is powerful. 
It's powerful. Listen, wait. It's powerful for both parties. It's obviously good for the person who receives the text or receives the letter. I mean, how many would not want to know that you're making a difference in somebody's life? Just this week, I don't think it was coincidence. After I, as a matter of fact, this section of the sermon was already finished. But Tuesday, we gathered to pray for your needs and to look at the praise reports right here in this altar. And I was reading through the cards, and I came across a card from a, one of our elementary school kids. And he put his name on there, but I'm not going to call it out. I don't want to embarrass him. But he said, I thank God that Pastor Allen's my friend. Now, it doesn't get any better than that. Come on. That's encouraging. Listen, that's uplifting. That lifted my spirit. And when you do that, obviously that's going to do that. But here's the other side of the coin. When we practice gratitude in our life and thanksgiving and encouragement, it does something in us as we do it. It opens up all kinds of benefits, and one of those is the joy of the Lord. And we know the joy of the Lord is our strength. If we want to thrive at life, we will be encouraging. We will exercise gratitude and thanksgiving. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love what Craig Rochelle says. He's a pastor and an author. He says about this. Look at the screen. If you think of something nice to say about somebody, say it to him or her immediately. Don't wait. Why? Because it won't happen. Oh, I'll do it when I see him. No, you won't. You'll forget. I think this may be one of the biggest things we can pull from this message. If you don't get anything else out of this message today, whoever you're thinking of right now, today, send them a text, send them a letter, send them an email, and let them know how much they mean to you. It will bless them, it's powerful for them, and it's powerful in your life as well. Hallelujah. Verse 4, whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners. Everybody say partners. Come on, say it again. Partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Now, how could this group of people be his partners? This is the Apostle Paul. They're not in prison with him. They're not traveling with him. They're not writing half of the New Testament. How could they possibly be his partners? All right, at this point, I need to teach you a little bit. I need to do a little history about why this book was written, about why this letter was written. Uh, Paul wrote the, 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 book while, uh, the letter while he was in a Roman prison, like I said, in A.D. 63, about 10 years after he planted the church on his second missionary journey. Now, we don't have time to read it, but if you want to do your homework, Acts chapter 16 is the record of the founding of this church and, and how the church was planted. And basically, a woman, an entrepreneurial woman, got saved. Come on, all you ladies. Woo! Hallelujah. She got saved, and her family got saved. And then a jailer got saved, because Paul was always in prison. He was always arrested. Couldn't keep his mouth Shut, thank God, because we wouldn't be here otherwise. And the jailer got saved, and his family got saved, and, and they started this church together. Now, Philippians has a very different tone than any of the other letters or epistles that Paul wrote. It's more about the heart than logic. It was more about community and relationship than doctrine or correction. Paul had a special relationship with these people. And he wrote the letter in response to a life-changing, perhaps life-saving gift that he received from them while in prison. What you need to understand, I know this is a little bit of teaching, just bear with me. What you need to understand about prison and Roman prison at this time is they didn't have to do anything for you. There were no laws about how they took care of you in prison. You know, in our prison system, they get three squares a day. They get, they get exercise. They get cable television, you know, all this stuff, and we're paying for it. But anyway, it's okay. I'm not bitter. Listen. No, I'm just, I'm serious. I'm serious. We have laws, don't we, where we take care of no matter, you know, what, what, what they've done, we take care. They didn't have that. So prisoners in this time period had to rely on family and friends to bring them food, and provisions from the outside, often they would have to bribe the guards and all kinds of stuff that would happen to take care of them. Or they, they might die in prison. Well, this church knew this, and they loved Paul. 
And so they came together, and they were poor, but they came together and they took up an offering and they took the money and the provisions and whatever it was to Paul in prison, and he, it changed his life. It may have saved his life. And he is thanking, he's writing this letter primarily to thank them for that. He's wanting to make sure they know, hey, you're not just a church, you're my family. And you are partners with me in ministry. You may never leave this country. You may never travel to Israel or Pakistan or Panama or any of these places that the church goes. But if you pray for us when we go, if you give towards those trips, you are just as much a partner in that as the person who physically goes. I want to remind you that we are sending the rent, monthly rent, to Pastor Sammy in Pakistan so that he can keep his Christian school open and so that those little kids are off the street and are taken care of. We are partners, even though the vast majority or all of you may never step foot on the property, we are partners with him in ministry. That's what Paul is talking about right here. And it's, it's, it was important that Paul knew how much, they, they knew how much he loved them and also how much they needed each other. Paul needed them, and they needed Paul. Here's an extremely important point for today. Look at the screen. We will not thrive at life without community. We, it just won't happen. If you want to grow in your faith, if you want to get stronger as a believer, it's not going to happen without other believers around you. It's not going to happen in isolation. It's not going to happen by sneaking in the back on Sunday and then taking off and never seeing anybody <laughs> the rest of the time. I know. I know how it goes. I'm glad that you're here. But see, we're in rows right here. And this is important. This is so important that you, that church attendance and coming, we don't forsake the gathering together. Amen? That's, that's the word of God. But if that's all we do, we're going to be limited in our growth. And if we isolate ourselves, we're going to be open to the attacks of the enemy. That's why it's so important what Pastor Cody's doing here at this church. That's why we invested in that position. Because small groups is so important. If you haven't signed up, you need to do so. You need to be surrounding yourself in a circle of people who are like-minded, who are going the same direction, who will encourage you, who will help you, who will minister one to another. Paul knew that. The Philippians knew that, and we need to know it as well. We will not thrive. We will not thrive in our Christian walk without community. Amen? All right, I just want to make sure you had not fallen asleep. Verse 6, And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Paul is talking about the process of maturing in our faith, of persevering and growing in our walk with Christ. Connecting with our God-given purpose. Now, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But how many feel like maybe your spiritual walk, your spiritual journey has stalled out? That you're just not growing in the faith like you once were. Maybe even going backwards. Come on. When you first got saved, everything was exciting. You were growing by leaps and bounds every single day. Coming to church was like a pep rally. and You were on fire. Nothing could stop you. And then you, you, you go into a season where it's not as fun and, and life happens and there's struggles and maybe there's a mistake, there's a sin, something happens in your life. Whatever it is, it's just not happening. It's not progressing like it once was. When I was a senior in high school, I grew more my senior year in my faith and in my walk than probably my whole life. I decided, this is a 17-year-old boy, I decided I was going to fast my lunches at school and go into the choir room. And there was a piano and I was a musician. I would play and sing and worship. And I grew more. There'd be days when I would come out of there and feel like Moses. I mean, you know, that light coming on. It just was amazing. And then the next year happened and I started college. And everything changed. My schedule changed. My life took on. I was still following Christ, but it was not the same. 
I'd fallen into kind of this, felt like a hole, wasn't growing. Paul is trying to let us know here. Look at the screen. When you are discouraged, remember that God will never give up on you. When you are discouraged, when you're down, when you're disappointed, God, you need to understand there is therefore now no condemnation to him who is in Christ Jesus. Listen, we don't get bonus points for more prayer hours. It's not like that. The prayer is for us. The benefit is for us. God's not there with a lightning bolt like this. He wants to draw close to you. But what you need to understand is if he began a good work in you, he will finish it. It's a promise. It's his provision. We need to stand on that word and believe it regardless of what's happened in our life, regardless of how far back we may have backslidden or done anything else. Don't avoid the conversation with God. Don't avoid his presence because you're embarrassed or ashamed. That is not his heart. That's the enemy talking. The Holy Spirit will convict. He will not condemn. He will draw you. His, God's arms are wide open. The Father is waiting to heal you and forgive you and set you back on that course. Unfortunately, we do a lot of times the same thing we do with people. If we stick our foot in our mouth, I know nobody does that, but if we offend somebody or say something stupid or do something stupid, instead of taking care of it and talking to them and working it out, we avoid them. <laughs> Y'all are quiet. Come on, you know it's true. The danger is we do the same thing with God sometimes. And all along, he is wanting us to come to him in those times. He's longing for us to come. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Don't let your present condition rob you of the joy of knowing Christ. Did you, let me say it again. I didn't put it on the screen. Don't let your present condition, if you're feeling down, if you're feeling uh, unfinished or distressed by your shortcomings, don't let that season and that how you're feeling right now rob you of the joy of walking with Christ. Come back to him. Turn back. Posture your life to him. And he will meet you there. And he will continue the work that he started in you. I don't care if it's 50 years ago. My God, that's good. I don't care. That's nothing to him. I don't care if it's 10 years ago. I don't care if there was a divorce that happened. God can heal. God can, can make all things new. He can set you on that course again. Give him praise one time. Come on. Verse 7. And I'm closing. Hey, listen, one of my uh, New Year's, my only New Year's resolution was to preach shorter and more focused messages. Now say amen. I know that will make you a lot of you. Yeah, hey, be nice. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but you know how resolutions go. <laughs> Don't get to you. No. Let's read verse 7, shall we? So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news of the gospel. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Have you ever missed someone so badly that your body physically aches? Sometimes it's, it's someone who's gone on to be with the Lord or, or, or whatever, or someone who's, who's just not with you anymore, was, used to be living, maybe it's a child's going to college, whatever. It's the most wonderful and terrible thing. Your body, you're missing that person so badly. That's the way Paul was with these people. He longed to be with them. His body ached to embrace them. But it wasn't just because of the gift that they gave him. It's because they were united. In Jesus. This is something very, very powerful to me and very important in my ministry. I've always felt this way. Look at this screen. Unity. 
Unity among believers can be one of the most powerful weapons of spiritual warfare that we have. Satan knows that. Why do you think he works so hard in dividing us? In using the most stupid things to cause division in our family, in our church, in our home? God is giving us growth at New Life. Praise God. But I can't help but just feel a little bit guarded. Because as we are being used of God in, the, in this community and in the kingdom, it puts a giant target, spiritual target, on our back. But let me declare to you today, greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. And if we bind together in unity under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ, even if there are differences, and there will be, even if there are discussions and, 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 and disagreements, and there will be, if we remain one and conscious that we are one in the name of Jesus, then we will be more than conquerors in Jesus' name. And God will use us for his kingdom. Unity. The longest prayer recorded in the Bible of Jesus. In John 17, he mentions unity four times. Do you not think it's important? He said, Lord, let them, he's talking about the future church, let them be one as we are one. God forbid we let stupid things divide us. God forbid we let politics divide us. God forbid we let the color of the carpet or the lighting or the, the whatever, you know, Churches divide over these kind of things, or the finances, or whatever it is. We've got a job to do. God has, is raising us up to make a difference. Let's be conscious of this. This is the weapon, unity, in the name of Jesus. Not under Pastor Allen, under Jesus. If God be for us, who can be against? unity. We are better together. We are stronger together. We can accomplish more together. Again, this is why we need community. Pastor, I don't, I just, I, in this season of my life, I, I'm just really, really busy. Come on, tell me something I don't know. I know you're busy. I'm busy. We're all busy, busy, busy. It's part of the problem. But we're all busy. I know that. But we make time for what is important to us. I'm busy, and yet I watch two football games where both of my teams lost. <laughs> Come on. Are you getting my point? We make time for what is important to us. And community should be at the top of the list. That is, if you want to thrive. No, Pastor, I really don't. I'm just, I'm, 2018 is going to be my lowest. No, come on. Our big idea, our big idea is a review of the message. Thriving in the new year means praying the will of the Father exercising gratitude in all we do and making time for community. Let's briefly look at those. Praying the will of the Father, not for the next big thing, not for the next shinier, newer thing. We've got enough stuff. Let me say it again. We have enough stuff. That's why Christmas is so frustrating, trying to buy presents for people who don't need anything. It ends up in their closet, or they just wrap it up and give it to somebody else. Come on, we don't need more stuff. Don't let stuff consume your prayer life. Pray the will of the Father. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer. 
exercising gratitude in all we do, letting that person who's blessing our lives, letting them know, being encouraging to somebody, and letting gratitude take over our life, which brings the joy of the Lord, and making time for community. If you want to thrive in 2018, the Word of God tells us how to do it. And it's not based on your income. Four of you agree. If I just made more money, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't. If you want to thrive, we will pray the will of the Father. We will be gracious and exercise thanksgiving and gratitude. And we will make time for circles and not just rows. Will you stand with me?